Tonight, I want to talk about the oil crash and how it could still pose serious risks to the stock market. Oil and oil stocks are still in a bear market, and the banking sector is starting to show signs of weakness. A major contributing factor to that could be weakness in the oil and gas sector because banks have loaned billions and billions of dollars out to the energy companies over the last couple of years. And that could be rearing its ugly head now with low oil and gas prices. When the banking sector gets into trouble, the stock market tends to get into trouble as well. Now over at my stage analysis screening tool at screener.nextbigtrade.com, I can see different sectors of the market and what stage each of these sectors is in. And for example, on the markets page, I can go over and look at markets that are that are predominantly in stage four, where the biggest percentage of, of these of these sector is in a stage four. And if I scroll down to the oil and gas stock or sectors, <clears throat> I can see that almost fifty percent of independent oil and gas drillers are are in a stage four decline. Uh, oil and gas pipeline stocks are mostly in a bear market. So are oil and gas drilling and exploration stocks and oil oil and gas service stocks. So the oil and gas sector as a whole is still largely in a stage four decline. And one key thing to note about stage four is that it very rarely ends with zero or one retests of the 30 week moving average from the downside. A lot of the people that are bullish on oil and gas stocks are expecting the oil and gas sector to just break back into a new bull market after only being in a stage four decline for a few months. So they're expecting basically that the bear market to end without any retest of the 30 week moving average and any further declining or consolidation action before a new bull market uh, in the oil and gas sector. And that's just not how the stages typically um, evolve. So if you look at the chart of oil, you can see that after the big collapse in oil prices starting in July of 2014, you know, we're finally now with a consolidation and a little rally starting to retest the 30 week moving average. But the main idea here is that the first retest of this 30 week moving average is not going to typically be the final break above the 30 week moving average that would that would launch oil into a new bull market. You know, at a minimum we should see this market retest this average a few times and consolidate before it would launch into a new bull market or it could potentially just be retesting this average to only go into a new decline from there. Now next I want to talk about what makes this crash in oil pose such a significant threat to the financial sector and to the overall stock market. And the key idea is that hardly anyone predicted this collapse in oil prices. And when a lot of money is invested in an area where no one thinks a market can go down, bad things can happen. And obviously a glaring example of that is what happened with the subprime housing crisis in 2008. You know, everyone became convinced that home prices would go up forever and banks made insane subprime loans to lend or to borrowers that weren't qualified to pay back the loans and it basically brought down the entire financial system. Well, in this case, and what I'm going to show in a little bit is that banks basically have lent a ton of money to energy companies over the last five years thinking that uh, oil prices were high oil prices were here to stay and it turns out that once the energy companies invested this money and started producing more oil it collapsed oil prices and now there's a lot of loans out there that are running into trouble because at lower oil prices these energy companies can't don't have the cash flow to pay back these loans 
which poses serious risk to the financial markets because a lot a lot of money was loaned out to these companies so you know in this article it just talks about you know how no one predicted the oil price collapse and you know even the US Energy Information Administration in 2014 predicted oil prices to be from $160 on the upside to 70 on the downside so they weren't even coming into consideration of an oil price in the thirty to fifty dollar range, is which is where it is now, which is you know what a lot of banks probably predicted as well, and what caused them to loan a ton of money to the oil and gas sector. Uh, this article, which was entitled uh, "As Oil Prices Fall, Banks Serving the Energy Industry Brace for a Jolt," and a key graph on this article talks about Lending, underwriting, and advising on behalf of energy companies has been a strong business for North American banks, and expected slowdown as a result of falling oil prices may hurt banks' revenue. And you can see in this graph just how significant the the amount of lending was to the oil and gas sector, and how it poses an overall uh, investment banking revenue for these banks. Like for instance. Citigroup and JP Morgan both loaned over four hundred million dollars to the oil and gas sector uh in two thousand fourteen and you know they make up twelve percent and then six point six percent of the bank's revenue. And you can see that you know a couple of Canadian banks, which I'm gonna show next, I mean look at RBC Capital Markets and Scotia Bank, they about twenty and thirty five percent of their revenue comes from the oil and gas sector. So, you know, a significant portion of these banks' earnings come from profits from oil and gas loans. And another article I wanted to show you is that, you know, this article talks about how the plunge in oil can trigger a subprime debt crash. There's some really interesting stuff in this article, but basically they say that during the last decade shale boom, which propelled the United States towards the world leading oil production, oil companies here and in Europe have taken on record levels of debt. This is true of both independent shale oil producers and long established oil majors for different purposes. The, re the repayment of that debt requires prices of a barrel of Brent crude oil to range between eighty to one hundred twenty dollars a barrel. So therefore when oil crashes back down to sixty to sixty five dollars a barrel you're either going to have, you know, two things can happen. Either the oil shoots back up, which which starts to solve the problem, or you see a collapse of energy debt, which could trigger a financial crisis in the United States, which has already happened in Norway. So uh, here they talk about the world's leading oil and gas companies are taking on debt and selling assets at an unprecedented unprecedented scale to cover a shortfall in cash, calling into question the long-term viability of large parts of the industry. Companies appear to have been borrowing heavily both to keep dividends steady and to buy back their own shares, spending an average of $39 billion on repurchases since 2011. So I mean this is a very leveraged sector that a lot of people don't realize and what I want to show you next is the effect of the oil crash that can already be seen in the banking stocks. So if I look at the Bank of Nova Scotia, you can clearly see in this chart that you know when the price of oil started crashing in July of 2014, it just has an immediate effect on this bank stock um, ever since then as well. I mean, essentially, ever since oil has been crashing, this bank stock has launched into a stage four decline. And you can see here that it's retesting the 30-week moving average just like oil and gas stocks are right now. So, you know, if this stays in a stage four decline, this would be an ideal time to actually short the stock when it's trading above the 30 week moving average in a downtrend. You know, next I want to look at Royal Bank of Canada. And again, since these Canadian banks are so tied to the price of oil with, you know, loans to oil and gas companies, you can see that as soon as oil crashed, this bank stock came under pressure as well and it's already in a stage four decline just like Bank of Nova Scotia. Now if you want to talk about US banks 
U.S. banks are mostly in a stage three kind of a topping process right now. You can see how choppy this market has been all during 2014 and still in 2015. And really, I, th I think what happens to United States banks is going to be a key tell to whether the U.S. stock market remains in a bull market or goes into a bear market. So this is a, a chart that I'm paying attention to closely because we can't definitively say that U.S. banks are in a stage four yet, but they're under watch because of this is a this is a textbook stage three top, you know. So it could easily, if it does transition into, into a stage four, it could spell trouble for the U.S. stock market. And you know, here's a key bank stock in the United States, Bank of America. You can see that Bank of America is is also in a stage three, and actually in 2015. Now it's it's retested its 30-week moving average from the low side, but failed here. I mean, this is kind of a potential setup into a stage four here. So this is another thing that I'm watching to see if if Bank of America, America continues to break down, it could pose trouble for the U.S. stock market. Uh, in my previous um, discussion on the energy sector, I talked about the uh, Ameritrade Investor Movement Index. And how it shows how you know where retail investors are putting their money, and this is the report for April. And what I talked about before was how retail investors continued to buy energy stocks, even though they continued to go down in a bear market. And yet again, we can see in this report that they say continued price pressure on oil producers and energy-related stocks appear to translate into buying opportunities for Ameritrade investors as they bought shares in ExxonMobil, Chesapeake Energy, and Sea Drill. You know, they, they were all buys during the sec during the quarter by Ameritrade clients, but they saw declines in their values over the period. So basically Ameritrade investors are buying these stocks even though they continue to go down in a bear market. And that's unfortunately what people tend to do early in bear markets is they try to buy a bargain instead of waiting for the bear market to go through its entire life cycle. And, um, you know, that's where you find a better buying opportunity. Right now, they're just buying too early in the bear market. Now, again, uh, talking about the U.S. banks, uh, if you look at XLF, you can see how you know the banks are a, are a key sector for the US stock market uh, when they're in a bear market they basically the US stock market has no hope of being in a bull market and a good example of that is 2011 and 2012 and what happened to XLF uh, you can see in this chart that XLF started to go into a stage 4 decline in 2011 but then it based out and then it started advancing in 2012 before it finally started ripping higher in 2013 into a new bull market where while the key thing to note here is that the US stock market was also in a negative period in 2011 and for most of 2012 while the bank stocks remained under pressure as well so you know it's a good example of how the the US stock market is not going to decouple from the banking sector and go higher so if we see the banking sector continue to go under pressure up here, you know, look out for the U.S. stock market. And finally, I want to show the uh, XLE Energy ETF and show how it's, once again, it's retesting the 30-week moving average from the downside. And this is getting investors in energy stocks excited, but the problem is, is that you're seeing no volume on the breakout higher above the 30 week moving average and two we're still early in this bear market so instead of being a buying opportunity here I would look for XLE to continue to come under pressure and if it eventually breaks back lower here we're gonna know that it's still in a bear market uh, thanks and have a good night